for coming. Uh, I know it's been really difficult for me to try and pick which talk and which slot I want to go to. Um, so thank you all for coming to enjoy my talk, because I know there are a lot of other really good talks right now. Um, my slides are already posted online, so if you have a hard time seeing the screen or following along and you want to have a copy of them locally to take a look at, uh, feel free to go ahead and pull them down. Uh, FDD OS Bridge 2015. Um, this is a pretty emoji heavy presentation. Um, I hope everybody's okay with that. Um, I don't actually know how emoji works for screen readers, so I'm not actually using emoji in the place of any words. I'm just using it to enhance some of the slides a little bit. Um, my name is Ryan Kennedy. I'm a back-end engineer at Magic Vibes. Um, we're not quite released yet, so you may not know too much about us, but hopefully you will in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I'm also an a ADA advisor or initiative advisor for the ADA initiative. Um, I helped out with a fundraiser last year uh, and enjoyed it so much that when I was asked uh, early this year to come and join them as an advisor, um, I very enthusiastically said yes. Um, I think they're doing a lot of tremendous work, um, and if you get the opportunity to check out either one of their uh, workshops or ADA camps, uh, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, in a past life, I've been doing software development for about 15 years now. Uh, I spent about five years at Yahoo working on the Yahoo Mail web service, the web service that actually, the back end service that powers the front end. Uh, I spent about a year and a half at Netflix working on search and the Netflix API. Uh, and most recently, I spent about four years at Yammer uh, working on the infrastructure team uh, all the way through our acquisition with Microsoft. Um, so I want to talk a bit about what fear is actually, like at the physiological level, what actually is fear. And it's this feeling of anxiety concerning the outcome of something, or it's a particular concern over the, the well-being of individuals that you have. Um, my talk's going to be really focusing on more of the anxiety and the outcome part of it more than the personal uh, concerns part. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what actually causes fear. I mentioned the physiology of fear. Um, and I spent a lot of time actually thinking about you know, what actually is fear. I don't want to put fear in the talk and not actually understand uh, and make sure that fear is actually the right word that I'm supposed to be using for this. Um, and so it became this very interesting sort of exploration into how the fear mechanisms in the brain uh, and in our genetics. Um, and one of the very obvious ones is that specific fears develop uh, in response to learning. Um, specific traumas, like if you were a child and you were bitten by a dog, it's quite likely that you're going to be afraid of dogs as you go into adulthood. That would be a completely reasonable thing to have happen. Um, in addition, certain fears are more common than others. Uh, scientists have actually found that it's easier to induce particular fears in a laboratory setting, um, and it's this notion they call preparedness. Um, and they believe that this is actually something built into our base genetics, that um, there are certain things that we are more prone to be fearful of and that this served us well sort of in the, the evolutionary trek of humankind, um, that if you were more able to be afraid of a thing that you should be afraid of, you were more likely to survive any sort of encounter with these things. In addition, um, there's this notion for individuals to emotionally converge. So if you are happy and you smile at someone, they're likely to smile back at you. There's this notion of mimicry. Um, in addition, if someone is a little bit nervous or on edge, you start picking up on that vibe a little bit and you start feeling a little bit nervous. Um, and you know, this is something that we pick up on and it helps us, again, in sort of this evolutionary tact of being able to say, someone else is afraid, why are they afraid? Should I be afraid? Oh my god, I'm afraid now. I should, I should get ready to run. There's so something's going on. I don't like this. And what ends up happening is that you, you see this distress in another human being, and in the brain, it actually begins triggering certain pathways in the brain um, that are actually tied to your fight, or, your fight or flight senses, right? So you actually, you see the fear in someone, you begin, you start feeling that mental agitation, and this is your body's preparation to preserve your life, basically. It's trying to make sure that you're ready to go because you've seen something else that's going on. Even though you can't see the source of the fear, you see the evidence of the fear in somebody else. And so the long and short of it is that fear is contagious, right? You can be around people who are afraid and yourself become afraid as a result of this. Um, in addition, negative emotions are usually more infectious than the positive emotions. So if you have a positive emotion and a negative emotion of roughly the same magnitude, I don't know what units they actually use to measure these things, but scientists talk about you know, having a positive effect and a negative effect. And the negative effect, even though it's at the same magnitude, um, it's more infectious than the positive one. And this, again, sort of seems to relate back to 
sort of the self-preservation aspect. We want to make sure that it's, it's great that when someone smiles that you smile back at them, um, but it's survival tactics that make sure that when someone is scared, you start picking up on that. Uh, in addition, negative emotions elicit a stronger reaction than the positive ones, uh, and it's the notion called negativity bias. Um, and again, all sorts of things meant to make sure that we as humans are picking up on the fear in other things. And for a large engineering organization, this is terrifying, right? This means the, you know, if you work in large organizations, particularly ones with open spaces, um, you know how quickly little colds happen to pass around the office. Um, fear sort of works the same way, right? It's the heebie-jeebie flu. It just, someone's afraid of a piece of code in the code base that begins spreading to the team, that then begins spreading outside of the team into the rest of the organization, right? Um, you know, these sort of urban myths start running amok inside the organization. Uh, in addition, fear is additive. Um, so if you're a little bit afraid of snakes and you're a little bit afraid of planes, you put snakes and planes together. <laughs> Recipe for disaster. Like, it's not like you know, you're kind of this afraid of snakes and this afraid of planes and you just kind of take the max of the two. No, you like multiply or add these things together on top of one another. Um, so uh, in addition, fear compounds. Uh, so little fears left undealt with, they sort of build up over time. It's not like, you know, if you're kind of afraid of snakes, but you never address snakes, you don't just kind of stay at that same level of fear of snakes. You kind of always have that thought in the back of your head, and it starts building and building and building over time. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later on. Um, so what are humans actually afraid of? Death, taxes, unpredictability, public speaking maybe? Uh, anybody else speaking here who has a little bit of a anxiety around getting up in front of audiences? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm also afraid of databases. Uh, Yammer actually paid me to build one. Um, sick. <laughs> um, databases are actually really terrifying. They're super complicated, like the, actual, the good ones, anyway. Um, they're super complicated. We ask them to store all these details that if we ever lost those things, we'd probably go out of business, right? So you're putting a lot of faith in this very complicated thing to hold on to your very most valuable data. Um, and we put these databases on pedestals, right? You know, as an engineer coming up, you know, through my first couple of years, I would never have thought like, oh yeah, I'll build a database someday. Instead, it was like, no, 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 no. I'm never going to build a database. That sounds way too hard. Um, you know, I've got my CS degree and all, but I don't think I'm going to build a database anytime soon. Um, if you don't feel like you have a healthy fear of databases, um, Google Kyle Kingsbury someday and go watch one of his Jepson talks, and he will instill, instill a significant amount of fear in you, particularly if you run things like MongoDB or Redis. Um, so what do developers fear? Like, what's, what's the actual crux of this talk? What are the things that developers are or should always be on the lookout for? Uh, refactoring comes up a lot. Um, and I'm mostly talking about large refactoring projects. I'm not talking about, like, rename this variable. Uh, I'm talking about large-scale refactorings, either of code bases, large code bases, uh, critical sections of code, um, or even whole systems. So not even talking about code, but talking about, you know, Yammer had a large microservices architecture, and just thinking about moving pieces around in there was very difficult, because in a lot of cases, we didn't know all the dependencies that were there. We didn't know sort of the things that would happen that would ripple out of it. Um, so whenever you think about things like, you know, um, one of the talks that I was in earlier this week was talking about uh, gender fields in social networks. Um, imagine taking that gender field, which is a binary, and switching it to some sort of freeform text field, and start thinking about all the places that has to ripple out through your application. Uh, think about, you know, if you ever, I don't know how many companies here are built on like monorail type architectures. Yammer started out as a giant Ruby on Rails monolith with a giant Postgres monolith. Um, and about the time that I arrived there, we were starting to crack that thing apart. Um, terrifying prospect when you think about the fact that you had 30 people working in this code base. You had thousands and thousands of lines of code, giant databases that had to start getting split apart. Terrifying uh, when you first sort of take a look at it and just sort of try and take in the whole expanse of the problem. Um, one of the other big problems that we had at Yammer was uh, we invested fairly significantly early on in Scala, had a lot of runtime problems with it, and began porting a bunch of things over to Java and starting to think about, you know, as we begin doing some of these ports, these microservices, and moving them over, what sort of problems are we going to run into? Uh, performance. Um, how many people here have an architecture that incorporates some aspect of queuing? Yeah. How many of you actually monitor things like your queue depth? Yeah. How many of you pushed a build and then watched your queue depth skyrocket and then worried that you were never going to burn it back down to zero? Um, yeah. 
Uh, this is one of the big things that happened at Yammer. We would always push something, and we would notice that, oh, hey, the performance of this thing is not as good as it used to be. It's now backing up queues. We don't have sufficient back pressure. We're starting to drop messages on the ground. Uh, performance is one of those things that um, a lot of companies don't address adequately, and so you don't find out until you reach production. And a performance problem once you've reached production is just kind of the worst thing in the world. Troubleshooting it, dealing with it, the anxiety of, the, of knowing your customers are out there and they can't actually get to your product. Um, Scale. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had this experience of you deploy a build and everything looks great, the build's gone out fine, and suddenly the operations team comes by and knocks on your desk and they're like, hey, did you guys change anything recently? I'm like, why? And they're like, well, the database's load is at 10x what it used to be, and the only thing that's changed is you push a deploy, and it's like, okay. And you go back and you look at the diff in the code, and you're like, oh, hey, there's this one method that gets called on every request, and someone put a loop in there, and inside the loop is making calls to databases. So instead of one call to the database per request, now we're making 10 calls to the database per request, right? Um, you know, or you, you've taken this log of n uh, thing, and you've changed it to an n squared thing, like little small changes that all of a sudden blow up your scale uh, very easily. Um, there's even issues with, you know, Yammer had a number of components that we pushed into production very early on when we had like tens of thousands of users and they were running great. Um, and then we're like, okay, we don't need to work on real time anymore for a while. And then like two years later, someone's like, hey, the real time system just keeps falling over. It's like, well, why? And it's like, well, when we put it up, we had like 10,000 users and now we have like 10 million users. And you're like, oh, like nobody's actually gone back to address these things. So, you know, some of these scale things, they either result of a, they either come as a result of the change you did or a result in the change of your user behavior or even just the number of users you have. Upgrades. Um, upgrades are one of my favorite topics. Um, library upgrades, database upgrades, schema migrations. Um, if you're backfilling data, for instance, if you're putting up a new search index and you've got to backfill all the old data into it, um, as you're upgrading the libraries, what new bugs does this version have? Is this one as performance as the last one that you were on? Um, upgrading your major version of Rails, like how many companies are stuck on old versions of Rails because you're terrified to upgrade the major version because you don't know what's changed. <coughs> um, yeah, I'm had the same problem. I can't really throw stones. Um, upgrading Postgres database major versions as well, like any sort of big major upgrades, um, especially once you're at any kind of scale with any number of users and any amount of money coming your way start to become very terrifying to make those changes. Deploying, deploying is basically like take all those fears and roll them all up into one, right? You've got your database schema migration, you've also upgraded your version of Rails, and while that's deploying, someone's also upgrading your major version of, of Postgres. Um, it's just roll everything together. Um, and it all goes into deploy fear, um, especially if, you are, if you're a company that's not doing regular deploys, if you're doing deploys like once a week or even less, um, the window of change that actually gets into there makes it much more terrifying because you don't know what all is in there, right? If you're doing very small deploys, you know it's like, okay, it's this small change, it's this small change, it's this small change. At least when something goes wrong, you know how to pinpoint it back. When it's a week's worth of changes in an engineering organization of 150, it's very difficult to go back and figure out like, okay, so there's like 800 changes in here and which change actually did the problem. And you gotta go and run git bisect, assuming you can. Uh, the further and further you get into microservices architecture, the worse this gets because now you're talking about multiple deploys, right? The back end team's doing deploys, the front end team's doing deploys, the real time team's doing deploys, and it's all happening at the same time and total chaos. There's also just sort of the general unknown, right? Sometimes you have this instinct that um, there's things that you should be fearful of, but you're not exactly sure what. You just sort of have that gut feeling like, I don't know, like there's something about this build that just doesn't feel right today. Um, you know, we're using this new framework and just I, I can't put my finger on something that's wrong with this framework, but I just know that there's a lot of code behind this framework and there's just something that I'm probably not anticipating that may be going out with it. And you just, you have this unknown, unsettled feeling of until that thing actually is in production and running well, you don't sort of have that reassurance to like, nope, okay, everything's all right. So what's the actual downside of fear in software development, right? So we've talked about how we get to fear. We've talked about the sources of fear. Um, but like, so what? Like, we could just live with fear the whole time, right? Fear's not a problem. It doesn't affect your work whatsoever. It doesn't cause you to lose hair. Um, the big one uh, is this fear-induced loss of agility. So you have software teams who started out being able to run, run, run. You're doing deploys all the time. You're constantly making changes. The architecture's constantly revising. And over time, you find that you're just getting slower, and you're getting slower, and you're getting slower, until you're getting to the point where eventually you may even be at a complete standstill architecturally. Um, and you find that you know, there's bits of the code or there's bits of the architecture that you're now afraid to change. 
because you don't know what the effect of it will be, or because you look at it and you just sort of imagine this giant scope of work that's behind it. Uh, and you're trying to get people to say like, yeah, no, it's okay, we should totally take the time to go and rip out this old piece of technology and put some new bit of technology in its place, or we should shore it up so that it's more reliable than it is. Right? Time is one of the greatest things, like the hardest things that there is to actually get in software development. Right? You want time as an engineer to go and shore up things, to remove technical debt. Meanwhile, product managers, managers, they all want you building features. They want you building things that are generating value for the customer. Um, we'll talk a little bit about value for the customer and how fear relates to it, but fear also creates these local maximums. Right? So, you're over here kind of in your not very happy world, and over here there's sparkling hearts, and you really want to get the sparkling hearts. But in between you, there's this trough, right? And there's scary things inside the trough, right? This is your, I want to do my Rails 3 upgrade from Rails 2. Um, and it's terrifying to you because there's a whole bunch of stuff that's changed between Rails 2 and Rails 3, and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get to there. And meanwhile, you've got product managers who are like, hey, we got to get this thing out before that conference. We've got this other customer who won't sign a contract until we get this feature. Uh, and so there's a lot of pressure to want to get to the sparkly hearts world and to get to what everybody else wants. And the compounding fears that we discussed make matters worse, right? Over time, that trough, the, the big trough that you have to get across to get over to sparkly hearts, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and the fear gets tucked way down inside of there. It just gets more and more difficult the more time goes on to actually dig some of this stuff out of there. And so what happens is fear is actually erecting barricades around sort of the, the most vital things that you could be doing uh, for your software project, right? This is, this is ostensibly where this talk came from, is I was managing a software engineering team and there was a ton of work that we wanted to do. We had a giant backlog of all these things that were like, as soon as we have time, these are the things we need to start doing, or these are the things that are starting to page us the most often, or these are the things that are paging the ops team the most often that they're not even telling us about that we could be working on, or these are the things that we wanted to go do this, we went to go do this project over here and it was slowed because of the fact that we haven't resolved this other issue over here. We have these, these fears that we're routing around that we're trying not to deal with. Um, and so very quickly I began trying to convince my team that one of the things we had to do was find these sources of fear and really aggressively go after them. And that's sort of where this notion of fear-driven development came from, that fear should drive at least a certain portion of the prioritization of your projects. Um, that fear is generating all of this friction for your projects. That fear is just sort of this constant that slows down everything. Um, it prevents you from making progress as fast as you would want to. It prevents you from reaching those global maximums instead of these local maximums. Uh, and so we had to start talking a bit about how we were going to find ways of dealing with all of these fears and how we were going to get moved past them. Because we couldn't just sit there and complain and complain and complain about them um, because higher management doesn't like to hear complaints, they like to hear solutions. Um, and so going back to sort of the, the physiology and the psychology aspect of it, one of the biggest ways that they deal with fear is this notion of exposure therapy, uh, where you get exposed to the thing that you're afraid of but in a context where there's no uh, danger. And so you think about you know, that child who was bit by the dog when they were very young and trying to get over that fear as an adult. Uh, and one of the ways they might do that is they might take the child somewhere where they can actually go and see dogs at a distance, right? Start getting familiar with just, I'm going to see dogs on a daily basis, but they're going to be way over there. They're not going to be anywhere where they can get near me. And then maybe over time I'll get a little bit closer. And maybe at some point I'll get to the point where maybe there's a partition between me and the dog, but I'm still pretty close, like a glass partition or something. And now I'm close enough to the dog that I can see the dog, the dog's very close, I can see the features in the dog. Maybe I can hear the dog, maybe I can smell the dog. And then maybe we remove the glass partition and we replace it with a chain link fence where I can actually put my hand up there and let the dog sniff my hand. And these are the sort of things that exposure therapy would get you into. Testing is kind of my exposure therapy. Um, it is a way to basically say, I want to put all of the failures into that. I want to have, I want to have code that makes it so that I can address these fears without actually feeling like I'm in any kind of danger of them. So if you think about a refactoring project, one of the biggest things that you're worried about with a refactoring project is that you're going to do the refactoring, you're going to ship it to production, and then you're going to find out that something's broken. Testing is one of those ways, especially reproducible automated testing, um, is one of those ways that you can make sure that, no, I'm going to find out about it being broken super early on, hopefully on my development machine, if not there, hopefully in continuous integration, if not there, hopefully in my staging environment. Um, it also means that you know, once you get a set of these reproducible tests working really early on, you know, these tests validate that the product does exactly what it's supposed to do. And any change that I make, if I do, if I make a change over here and it breaks something way over here, the test should find these things. 
Um, and so it acts as sort of the safety harness, or if you think of like a trapeze artist with a trapeze net, um, it's sort of the, if you miss something, this is going to save you before you actually ship all the way to production. Um, so testing, testing is one of those things that I really tried to instill in my team as, you know, this isn't just sort of wasted time. This isn't checking the box and saying that we've got X amount of code coverage. This is going to save you later on. This is going to make sure that you don't accidentally let something slip into production. And it's sort of going to give you the confidence to be able to go ahead and make changes and say, like, I'm going to know if I made this change and it broke something. Um, development and staging are also really nice safety zones for things that are a bit more difficult to test. Um, so I mentioned at Yammer I was building a database uh, and one of the things I had to test was uh, some really nasty failure modes like someone just trips over a power supply or someone just decides to log into a box and low level format it. Um, and so I was able to begin executing all those things on my local box and say things like, okay, if I were to actually take out the primary, what would happen to my data? Would we actually recover from this? Uh, and be able to see with my own eyes that yes, all the recovery mechanisms in this particular database actually work. Right? I went and I kicked that machine, it lost all of its data, it failed over to the new primary, the replica caught up, and I didn't lose any data. I brought a new replica online, and I'm back to three-way replication. Right? This is sort of the notion of, if you think about baseball players, uh, baseball players don't go out and practice in Yankee Stadium. Baseball players go and practice on the practice field. Uh, and the reason they do that is because if you make an error in Yankee Stadium, you get sent back down to the minors. If you make an error in the practice field, you do that drill 10 more times. Then you go out to Yankee Stadium. Right? Development staging are kind of your practice fields before you go to production. Building confidence on non-critical systems. So this may not be totally feasible for everybody, but Yammer had a few systems where they were stateful, but where the state was considered non-critical. Um, so things like presence, so whether or not you're actually online at the moment. Um, in the very worst case, if we lost everything, if the whole present system went down, we just couldn't show that little green light next to you that says that you're online, the rest of the functionality actually works fine, though. In addition, if we lost all that data, we can reconstruct that data fairly quickly because all the clients know, hey, when the app is open, beacon down my presence every 30, 60 seconds or whatever. And so even if we had had just a catastrophic database failure, lost all the presence data, we would reconstitute that data very rapidly. And so what it allowed us to do is it allowed us to experiment with those platforms before going to the more critical platforms where, you know, maybe this is where all the credit card billing goes. That would be really bad to lose that data. Let's go try it over here with this other system first and see how it's going. Um, Stripe did a really interesting game day uh, back kind of end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, where they were running their fraud detection system on top of Redis. And they had some questions about Redis's ability to do failovers. And they decided they were going to do a game day exercise, and they were going to actually, in production, go and kill minus nine a Redis process and see what happened. And they wrote up this whole nice blog post about it. Uh, and long and short of it was uh, when they uh, when they ran a kill on the process for the primary, the primary went down, the secondaries had a new leader election, a new primary came online. The original Redis primary came back online a little too rapidly, decided that, oh, I, I'm back, I'm still the primary, yay. Um, then the other two secondaries decided, oh, look, the primary's back, let's reconnect to the primary. And the problem is they had turned off local snapshotting. They were only running stuff in memory. So when the primary came back online, it came back online with no data set. The two replicas reconnected to the primary and said, hey, there's no data in this Redis. We should drop all of our data. Very bad. Um, but this is one of those worlds where Stripe built a lot of experience on a non-critical system. It was a fraud detection system. So you know, it'd be nice if they didn't detect, or if they could detect fraud a little bit more quickly. Um, but in this case, the fraud database was going to reconstitute itself relatively rapidly. In addition, they had taken a backup before doing all of this. And so they could restore from the backup and just say, you know what, we lost maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes of fraud data. It's okay. Like, it's not going to impact the performance of the fraud system too much. Double dispatch when replacing existing functionality. Um, so the database that we built at Yammer was replacing uh, our old messaging system. And so we had old messaging system and new messaging system. And essentially what double dispatch is, is when I bring up the second system, I'm going to backfill all the data from the old system into the new system so that they're roughly at parity. And then the code that's actually writing to them is going to start writing to both. And so I get the new system up to parity. I keep them both at parity. Now the runtime system is taking all of its, it's sending writes to both systems and it's taking reads from the old system. 
once everything kind of looks okay, I begin turning a dial, and it begins shunting over some of the read traffic over to the new system. And I started letting it go, and I let it go, and I was like, okay, we're at 50% of traffic, performance numbers look okay, 75% of traffic, oh, nope, starting to get into some problems here. Let's crank the traffic back, let's look at what happened, let's resolve it. In the meantime, your users are kind of floating along oblivious to this, and you're just doing a little bit of double dispatch in the background. When everything is good, when you're ready to go, you crank that knob all the way to 100%, all your users are now shunted over to the new system. Right, so your users are reading data off the new system. The old system is still getting updates, right? It's still there if something happens. Uh, at some point you decide you're ready to go, you shut down the old system, and you've done it. You've successfully migrated from the old system over to the new system. You haven't had sort of this cutover period where there's sort of no way to go back. Right? You've had the time to sort of look at and evaluate and figure out how everything's running. Hack days. Um, hack days are something that I brought with me from Yahoo over to Yammer. Um, and what we started finding a lot was that engineers, you know, at Yahoo we had a lot of people who were trying to take on like, oh, I want to build the next cool product. At Yammer we had a lot of people who were like, there's this thing that really bothers me as a developer and I'm going to go and deal with it. Uh, and so Hack Day was really great for shining a light on sort of what the engineers perceive to be a lot of the problems in our architecture, in our development processes, uh, and allowed them to get up on stage for three minutes in front of all the execs. And the execs got to see really loud and clear what's important to the developers, what do they think we ought to be working on. In addition, Hack Day is sort of this, it's this fear-free environment, right? The very worst thing that happens is you decide to go take on a problem, maybe it turns out to be too much, you couldn't actually finish it, but you got to go and spend a bunch of time. You got to go spend maybe one, two, two days, maybe a full week going and investigating this problem, and you probably learned a lot about it that you can take back to your teams at the end of it. In the very best case, you solve this problem, you deploy this thing, that bit of fear has now been, it's gone, right? Um, and this is one of the nice things about, like, this sort of inverts the prioritization. In a lot of cases, you have uh, managers, product managers, program managers who are setting the prioritization. Hack days are one of those places where engineers get to set the priority. Um, and engineers are sort of your best bet of knowing where are the problems in the code bases, where are the places that we should be focusing some efforts on. Um, right? if, it's, if it's so important to an engineer that they will take this free time given to them to go after it, maybe it's important enough that management should, should be concerned about it as well. Um, another thing that was really helpful for me was sharing my fears. Uh, so when there were bits of code that I wanted to upgrade or systems that I had to build, being able to talk about the fact that I was, you know, I had a bit of intrepidation or anxiety about these things was really helpful because I had people who would look at me and say like, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm afraid of that too, right? And just that little reassurance like, oh, <laughs> like, good, I'm not imagining things. Like there's actually a thing there that I should be concerned about. Or maybe you run into an engineer who's like, oh no, I've done that before. Let me tell you about some past experience that I can share with you. Um, the best thing that happened for me was uh, this database we were building was built on Berkeley DB, and I got in touch with the Berkeley DB maintainers and sort of explained to them what we're doing, and they're like, yeah, this thing that you're doing, nobody else is doing. Um, and that's a little concerning at first because you know, you're building massive new architecture on someone's library, and they're like, yeah, you're using it no way and nobody else does. And you, you know, so you're thinking, you know, this isn't exactly built for my use cases. And they, they dig a little bit deeper, and then they finally say, but, you know, it should work. It should work just fine. Here's some things you got to watch out for. Configure this, configure that. Run this kind of a benchmark against it. Set this up. Um, and so, you know, being really open and honest about your fears, I think, will help get you either some reassurance or, the, or the very best case, someone who can just say, like, yeah, don't worry about that. That's going to be fine. You're going to be okay. Uh, Decatastrophizing, um, which is just a fun word but difficult to say sometimes, um, is sort of the you have this feared event and you sort of play it out in your mind a little bit. Like, what would happen? You know, okay, if I push this bit of code and it wipes out the database, then all of our user data is going to be gone. And if our user data is gone, all of our users are going to be upset and they're all going to leave us and we're going to go out of business and I'm going to not have a job. Um, this is sort of the very worst case. This is not decatastrophizing, this is catastrophizing. Um, in the decatastrophizing case, is sort of going back to the thing I mentioned before about running on my laptop and running a three node cluster and taking down one of the members of the cluster and seeing that it comes back up and being like, Oh, so what's going to happen is if someone trips on a power cord in the data center or if someone backs over one of our racks, we're going to lose one of the boxes in the rack and the other two are going to take over. The worst thing that could happen is someone has to take out like two racks in the data center. And it's like, and that rack is there, and that rack's way over there, and that rack's way over there. And you start thinking through the probabilities in your head, and you're like, how likely is it that two different racks so far apart on different power supplies, different networks could be so affected? And this sort of helps you to start backing down a little bit and understanding like, 
wow, it'd be really difficult to actually take out two nodes in this cluster and actually lose data. And even if we took out two nodes in the cluster, we have a third node. We wouldn't lose data. We wouldn't be able to do any reads. Or we wouldn't be able to do any writes at this point. We could still potentially do some reads, but we still have a copy of the data. We just need to get the data replicated to some more machines to get back to three-way replication. We'd be OK. So being able to actually talk it out and not just saying like, you know, oh my god, the database might blow up. Actually thinking through like, what would it mean for the database to blow up? What would actually happen um, can also be really helpful. Organizationally selective amnesia. Um, I don't know if anybody's caught the emoji, but this is uh, the red shirt emoji. Um, any Star Trek fans here? A few. So red shirts, always the ones to get sent down to the planet. Like 75% of the time, they don't come back. High mortality rate. Yet these red shirts keep going down. They keep going down, right? We send a red shirt down to the planet, red shirt doesn't come back. The next red shirt still goes, right? So the red shirt in this case is like a new hire. Uh, so we were doing, on this database that we had built, uh, we were doing library upgrades, uh, major library upgrades from Berkeley DB4 to Berkeley DB5. And we knew that there was a lot of little things in there that we had to be concerned about. Um, and nobody really wanted to do this upgrade. Everybody was kind of like, oh, no, I'm working on this project over here right now. I'm a little too busy for that. I've got vacation coming up. You know what? I think I'm going to have a kid any minute now. <laughs> um, so you hire somebody, um, someone who knows absolutely nothing about Java and who knows nothing about Berkeley DB and has no idea that you've been running Berkeley DB in production for about a year. Um, and you say, hey, uh, for your first project, you know what you should do? You should get really familiar with the database, and you should run this upgrade for us. It'll be a great way to learn about the infrastructure. And they think, great, look at this, my first day, and they're giving me this really important project. And little do they know that we need them to go in there because they're the only ones in the organization that don't have this, this fear of that thing. Um, and you, know, you can't just throw them off the deep end. You do have to support them a bit with this. Uh, but the, selectively, the selective amnesia sort of helps a bit with you know, when you've built up this fear too much in your head, and we talked about that compounding fear, um, part of that is just mentally. The fear builds up in your head to the point where you think you can't go after a thing. If you take someone who doesn't know any better and they go after it, you start seeing the places where like, oh, we, we just built this fear up in our head. There was nothing to be afraid of. We just needed to find someone who didn't have that fear to go in after it. Um, so are there any managers, leads, architects in the room? A couple. So this talk is largely about and for you. Um, it turns out engineers know a lot of this stuff already. A lot of engineers, we know about testing. A lot of managers know about it too, right? We all came from engineering. Um, but this is one of the important takeaways that came from this, um, which is part of the question is, are you part of the source of the fear, right? How much does it affect a, the perception of an individual um, if they fail on a project, right? I fail on a project, how exactly does that end up reflecting on them, right? This is part of the manager's responsibility in making sure that you know, employees understand that like failure is not like this black mark on you unless you actually like were ignorant, or not ignorant, um, I don't have the right word for it. If you're negligent in your responsibilities, right? If you failed because you failed, it's just a failure, right? It's not, there's no black mark because of this thing. Um, how are whistleblowers perceived, right? If you have employees who keep bringing up things like, hey, we should be really concerned about the way that we're using Redis because there's some ways that you use it that lose all of your data, right? You know, when the whistleblowers bring this up, are they sort of like, oh, hey, thanks for bringing that up. We should figure out what we want to do about this. Or is it, you know what, we're way too busy with this. We got to go and we got features to build. We got all this other work to do. The product managers have got us chock full of work to do right now. Um, do you have blameless postmortems? So when things do go wrong, how do you actually handle the way that they go? You know, is it that you want to pin it on the person who caused the database to go down? Or is it looking at, you know what, what is it organizationally that caused the database to go down? What could we have put in place that would have made sure that we couldn't have, have had this kind of a failure? Make the time to test. Um, testing is not just a box to check. Testing is, I, I had this analogy as I was walking around earlier today, testing is kind of like uh, those plates that print money, right? You make them once, and they just keep printing dollar bills all the time. Right? You write the tests once. They prove that your product does the thing that it's supposed to do. You put them in a vault, and then you keep running them periodically and make sure that your product still does that. Right? You spend the time to write the tests, and it will just keep printing money for you over time. So don't treat tests as kind of that box that has to check. It's not, you know, we've got to meet this amount of code coverage. It's we need the tests in place so that we feel confident that with every change that we make, we've not negatively affected the product in a way that we don't want it to have. Uh, make the time for research. Um, Yammer was particularly bad about this. 
um, as we were moving to things like Berkeley DB, later to Cassandra, um, they began starting to play around with HBase. One of the things that was very difficult is actually making the time for research. And so in a lot of cases, the decision around a particular database came in conjunction with building a particular feature. And so we would say things like, okay, we're gonna build a new messaging architecture, so get that out the door in two to 10 weeks. And it's like, well, we really should spend two to 10 weeks evaluating Cassandra versus Postgres versus Oracle NoSQL or something. And again, this is one of those things where you're trying to fight for time to do all this other work. And so research then becomes very important because research is another one of those things that sort of helps to keep at bay the fear, right? If you're just like, okay, we're gonna take Cassandra and we're gonna put it into production and we've never run Cassandra in production, your engineers are going to be terrified about the ways in which that's going to fail. Your engineers aren't gonna know how it's going to page you. When it does page you, they don't know how bad that page is. Is this a thing that we just like go and flip a button and it's okay? Or is this a thing where we gotta go and rebuild a cluster? Um, so make the time for research. Make sure that all the technologies that you're deploying are things that you understand really, really well and that your employees feel really comfortable having in production. Otherwise, it just becomes its own source of fear. Make the time for maintenance. Uh, so as you begin discovering some of these uh, pockets of fear, make sure that there's actually time budgeted in to be able to go and deal with them. Um, I know a lot of companies who like to say, you know, we'll deal with tech debt as we build features in the area of the tech debt. Um, and hey, this sounds great. Well, sure, yeah, you know, while we're in the vicinity of this, you know, leave the code better than you found it, which I am all for. But there are gonna be parts of the code that you never go back and revisit. For Yammer, it was our real-time system. We built the real-time system in 2010. And from 2010 to 2014, it didn't change, right? There was never a call to go back and revise that bit of the, that, that feature in the product. And so there was never a time where we were kind of in the vicinity of the problem. And meanwhile, the traffic on it had probably 100 x and all the assumptions that were made around scalability and performance back then were no longer true, but there was never any time to actually go back and address those things because, well, you'll go back and address that the next time we go do something in real time, which just never happens. So make that time for maintenance. Make sure that there's some amount of window to be able to go back and deal with some of this stuff, even if the product development never actually veers back into that area of code. Most importantly, none of this should impact people's personal lives. Um, this shouldn't sort of become second shift work for people. This shouldn't become, you know, I spend my eight hours in the office doing feature development, and then because I'm really passionate about wanting this problem to be gone, after I go home and have my dinner and tuck my kids into bed, then I go and I start working on all this other work that needs to be done because otherwise I get paged late at night and I get woken up and I show up in the office and I'm completely wiped out. Um, make sure that you're actually carving aside some time for engineers to be able to do this in the day to day. You can't just say like, well, you'll work your eight hours and then you'll work two hours more, right? Just because most engineers are salaried doesn't mean you get access to them 24 by seven. Uh, and that's it, thank you.